very pleased to invite you to welcome you to today's conference or the third day, third and final day of our conference on uh, philosophy, disability and social change. And we're delighted at how well it's gone so far and we're sure it will continue in a similar spirit today. Um, our first speaker is Michelle Churia from the University of Missouri at St. Louis. And uh, she's the author of An Intersectional Feminist Theory of Moral Responsibility, published Routledge this, this year, 2020. And as far as I know, it's the first book length treatment of intersectional feminism and moral responsibility together. And really an exciting book to read, which I look forward to reading, particularly as reading the preface, I see that it was written out of love and rage, which is a great combination. <laughs> um, Michelle has published in many interdisciplinary philosophy journals, and she's talking to us today, as you can see, on chronic fatigue and disability. Um, I'll pass over to Michelle just in a second. There are two things I want to say. If you want to use the captions, there's instructions in the chat but please look at the CC at your bottom of your screen, CC and closed captions. If you click on that, it will give you a number of options. We recommend you look at the subtitles and the full transcript if you want to get the full benefit. If they're coming up too small, you can adjust them on the subtitle settings. When it comes to the Q&A, if you could please put any questions you have in the Q&A, you can do that at any time during the talk. And then um, I will put those questions to Michelle later on. So you should put your questions into the Q&A, not into the chat, but you are welcome to use the chat for other purposes. Okay, so um, with no further ado, Michelle, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm very honored to be here, first of all, and I've enjoyed all of the presentations. So thank you very much. Um, okay, so this presentation is on capitalism and chronic fatigue. In this presentation, I'm going to offer a biopolitical explanation of chronic fatigue syndrome or CFS. First, I'll explain what CFS is, then I'll explain why I consider CFS to be a disability, which is not scientifically explainable due to the nature of disability. Then I'll expand on this argument by showing that different rates of CFS in different social groups have roots in expropriation under capitalism. More specifically, I'll say that expropriated groups are susceptible to CFS because expropriation puts them at risk of neglect, trauma, and exhaustion. So chronic fatigue syndrome is defined as unexplained fatigue that lasts for at least six months, accompanied by symptoms including headaches, unrefreshing sleep, muscle pain, and cognitive difficulties, such as memory and concentration problems. I have these types of experiences most of the time. I'm almost always tired and sometimes I can't get out of bed. I have episodic headaches, muscle pains, difficulty concentrating and difficulty speaking. At times I feel relatively energized, but most of the time I have experiences that fit the so-called symptomatic profile of CFS. Because I take CFS to be a disability, I prefer to say that I am chronically fatigued rather than that I have chronic fatigue syndrome as I take disability to be a socio-political construct similar to gender and race rather than a biological phenomenon or medical problem. To quote Shelley Tremaine, disability is a historically contingent apparatus of power, not a natural feature of the world. So just as I take myself to be a white woman, not a person with whiteness and feminine coded gender, I take myself to be a chronically fatigued person, not a person with chronic fatigue syndrome. The notion that CFS is a disability is controversial, but I think it has the features that critical disability theorists tend to attribute to disability. Namely, I take CFS to be one constituted by and through a complex and complicated set of biopower apparatuses, two, which produce distinct types of oppression, such as ableist prejudice and workplace exclusion, as per Shelley Tremaine's definition. And I take conditions one and two to make CFS three, something that the disability rights movement has a reason to promote justice for, as per Elizabeth Barnes's definition. 
I should note that Tremaine and Barnes provide substantively different conceptions of disability, but the point is that on either one, CFS would plausibly count as a disability. I also take CFS to be something that one can have reason to celebrate as it can confer epistemic and emotional advantages, such as privileged knowledge of ableist oppression and a passion for justice, and it can form the basis for meaningful relationships and political solidarity. These advantages are consistent with the understanding of disability espoused by the disability pride movement, as is the recognition that CFS is a target of ableist oppression, which leads to adversity. Precisely because CFS is a disability, it can't be reduced to a medical condition since neither the biopolitical apparatuses implicated in CFS nor the political adversities and epistemic emotional advantages that come with it can be explained by mainstream medical science. This follows straightforwardly from the definition of CFS as a political construct. Of course, these claims are controversial, especially number one. Um, in this presentation, I want to lend credence to one by unearthing some of the hidden political factors that play a role in CFS. Due to time constraints, I will focus on just one dimension of CFS, its prevalence in politically oppressed groups. This is a fruitful point of entry because as Adriel M. Trott argues, physiological differences across social groups are on close scrutiny, partly if not fully caused by political factors. For example, women experience disproportionately high levels of irritable bowel syndrome, partly because they suffer high levels of sexual assault and sexual assault changes the gut microbiome. Thus, patriarchal violence partially explains high rates of IBS in women. Along the same lines, I want to argue that capitalist labor relations partly explain high rates of CFS in expropriated groups by which I mean groups that have their resources and capacities confiscated without the minimal level of protection afforded by standard labor laws. This analysis will contribute to Marta, Marta Russell's claim that disability is a product of the exploitative economic structure of capitalist society, one which creates and then oppresses the so-called disabled body as one of the conditions that allow the capitalist class to accumulate wealth. In what follows, I'll outline the different rates of CFS in different groups, and then explain how capitalism as understood by Marxists partially explains these group level differences. So most people know that women are more susceptible to CFS than men, but few know that it's also prevalent in racialized groups. Historically, CFS was thought to be most common amongst white women of higher socioeconomic status, due to the medical racism and classism of the time. But recent studies have revealed that African Americans, Native Americans, and Hispanic Americans have higher rates of CFS compared with the white American majority. As do people in lower socioeconomic groups compared to higher SES people. In other words, the groups most susceptible to oppression under capitalism are also more likely to experience CFS. Now, let me explain what I mean by capitalism. I follow the Marxist tradition in understanding capitalism to be an, in, an industrial mode of production that allows an elite few to accumulate wealth by subjugating the majority of people, especially members of historically disenfranchised groups through regimes of exploitation and expropriation. Capitalism then is not simply a system of economic exchange, it's a system of oppression that submits historically disenfranchised groups to subjugation. To quote Nancy Fraser, capitalism is a mode of accumulation that is simultaneously a system of oppression, sorry, a system of domination. The disproportionate impact of capitalism on historically disenfranchised groups is captured in the terms racial capitalism, popularized by scholars like Cedric J. Robinson, Alufeme Taiwo, and Liam Kofi Bright, and patriarchal capitalism, popularized by the likes of Zilla Eisenstein and Christine Delphi. These labels indicate that capitalism and oppression are inextricably linked, such that we cannot have one without the other. As Eisenstein puts it, capitalist class structures and hierarchical sexual structuring, as well as racial structuring, are locked in a mutually reinforcing dialectical relationship, which gives rise to inevitable hierarchies of oppression. 
One reason for thinking that these systems can't be decoupled is that capitalism doesn't just submit subjects to oppression, it creates exploitable and expropriable subjects. As Kathy Weeks puts it, <clears throat> the wage relation generates not just income and capital, but disciplined individuals, governable subjects, worthy citizens, and responsible family members as defined by the logic of patriarchal racial capitalism. Indeed, given its centrality, both to individuals' lives and to the social imaginary, work constitutes a particularly important site of interpolation into a range of subjectivity, into a range of subjectivities. <clears throat> Nancy Fraser agrees that capitalism constructs exploitable subjects through political subjectivation. But Fraser adds a new subject position to Marxist thought by delineating between two oppressed classes, the free exploitable citizen worker on the one hand and the dependent expropriable subject on the other. This division is a contribution to classic Marxism's emphasis on two main classes, capitalists who own the means of production and propertyless producers who must sell their labor, who must sell their labor power to survive. Capitalism as such work Capitalism as such allows corporate owners to exploit the working class by paying them less than what, their, than what their work is worth, that is by confiscating the surplus value of their labor. Fraser points out that along with the proletariat class, capitalism creates a racialized underclass that is subject not only to exploitation, but also expropriation, a regime that works by confiscating capacities and resources and conscripting them into capital's circuits of self-expansion. Expropriation is, in many ways, more akin to the colonial settler state's original accumulation of assets through slavery and genocide than to exploitation through work, as it's not regulated by labor laws. In modern times, expropriation tends to take the form of predatory loans, prison labor, corporate land grabs, and similar acts of confiscation. These expropriative practices don't just oppress their target, but racialize the target group by marking it as a proper object of non-contractual, often violent modes of confiscation, rather than a subject of full citizenship rights. While Fraser focuses on racial expropriation in the article in question, she acknowledges that other oppressed groups are susceptible to other regimes of expropriation, Women, for example, are expropriated through unpaid caregiving, unpaid housework, and sexual violence. These regimes of expropriation may partially explain why rates of CFS are higher in women, Black, Indigenous, and Native Americans, and the poor, <clears throat> since expropriation puts people at risk for conditions that could trigger CFS, according to the leading scientific theories, which I should note are ultimately inadequate because they fail to situate biological factors in political contexts. Although the CDC says that there's no known cause of CFS, two of the leading speculative explanations are A, viral infections, and B, physical and emotional trauma. These triggers are more likely to affect members of expropriated groups due to the nature of expropriation. Consider the forms of racial expropriation highlighted by Fraser predatory loans, corporate land grabs, and prison labor. People susceptible to predatory loans and corporate land grabs are vulnerable to homelessness, which is a risk factor for vir viral infection, especially airborne infections like the flu, TB, diphtheria, and COVID-19. Imprisonment is another risk factor for infection. In fact, some prisons have released inmates on humanitarian grounds due to the high rate of coronavirus transmission and death. In addition, both forced displacement and imprisonment, partly due to inhumane shelter and prison conditions, correlate with physical and emotional trauma. If these triggers do play a role in CFS, then racial expropriation is an underlying political cause. Patriarchal regimes of expropriation also create distinct vulnerabilities. Caregiving creates a risk of viral infection insofar as ca caregiving carries a risk of viral infection insofar as caregivers may need to be in close proximity to someone with an airborne virus without having access to the personal protective equipment afforded to paid emergency responders. Sexual violence is a risk factor for sexually transmitted infections, as well as a source of physical and emotional trauma. 
Caregiving may also trigger emotional trauma when caregivers do not receive the material and emotional support they need from their communities, including PPE and basic respect, which is the case for many women, especially women of color. In fact, the UN says that women's burden of unpaid care work has increased due to the pandemic, and the rate of gender-based violence is increasing exponentially. Thus, patriarchal ex expropriation may be an unanalyzed political cause of high rates of CFS in women. Having said this, we can't know for sure whether viral infection and trauma play a role in CFS due to lack of sufficient data. But, there's all, but there is a ready-made explanation for the core feature of CFS being tired for more than six months. Tiredness, in fact, is a focal point of Marxist critique, which theorizes tiredness as a byproduct of the capitalist mode of production. While ordinary tiredness may not be identical to chronic fatigue, there are similarities in the experiential qualities and group prevalence in both cases, which suggests that there could be similar causes. Notably, there's significant overlap in rates of CFS and rates of tiredness. According to the CDC, women report being more tired than men. And the biggest tiredness gap is in the 18 to 44 age group, which is both prime working age and prime child rearing age. There's also a racial sleep gap, which produces a racial tiredness gap. The CDC reports that healthy sleep duration is lower among Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, non-Hispanic Blacks, multiracial non-Hispanics, and American Indians, Alaska, Alaska Natives, compared with non-Hispanic whites, white Hispanics, and Asians. Class also predicts poor sleep with those unable to work or unemployed, reporting lower healthy sleep duration compared to employed respondents. Groups with poor sleep quality tend to be more tired during the day, which means that groups with high rates of CFS are also more likely to be tired. According to Marxism, tiredness is an inevitable byproduct of capitalism. In Exhaustion, a History, Anna Schaffner explains how the Industrial Revolution transformed the psyche of the individual, owing primarily to changing cultural conceptions of the value of work and an increase in commodification of time. In the industrial workplace, the pace of work was no longer determined by nature, the seasons, and the weather, as it had been for all of human history, but became dictated by abstract rational principles such as clock time and measurable productivity. Factory workers were forced to keep pace with machines, performing the same repetitive movements over and over again all day long. As Marx put it in 1867, in the factory, we have a lifeless mechanism, which is independent of the workers who are incorporated into it as, a living, as living appendages. The wearisome routine of endless drudgery in which the same mechanical process is ever repeated is like the torture of Sisyphus. The burden of toil, like the rock, is ever falling back upon the worn out drudge. Um, at the same time, people began to see work, <clears throat> the source of their exhaustion and alienation, as the primary source of value and meaning and meaning in life. Of course, this is quite irrational, but it was facilitated by the popularization of a secularized version of the Protestant work ethic, which treats work as an indefeasible moral obligation and social responsibility. Any resistance to the drudgery of the daily grind then is perceived as a sign of moral corruption. Through this ideology, capitalism managed to produce constitutively exhausted workers. <clears throat> as Weeks put it, constitutively exhausted subjects. As Weeks puts it, what is essential about the work ethics, as Max Weber originally described it, was what it could do, deliver workers to their exploitation, not just by manufacturing subjects' consent to capitalist exploitation, but by constituting exploitative and exploitable subjects. Although Protestantism is no longer the dominant religion, the ghost of the Protestant work ethic still haunts the capitalist machine, producing an exhausted and largely compliant working class. Something missing from Weeks', Weeks analysis, however, is an account of expropriation, which is exhausting in its own right. Um, due to limited time, I can unfortunately just look at a couple of examples. So above I discussed predatory lending. One of the more salient examples of predatory lending was the high rate of subprime loans given to black and Hispanic homeowners just prior to the 2008 housing crisis. 
This practice resulted in high rates of foreclosures for Black and Hispanic households. To get out of debt, expropriated families had to navigate repayment plans with banks, find provisional housing, work harder in their jobs to pay off their debts, and in some cases declare bankruptcy. That is, the burden of expropriation gave rise to hyper-exploitation. Those foreclosure victims were then doubly exhausted under two brutal modes of confiscation. Um, next, consider unpaid housework. Feminists have argued that on top of the standard work shift, women often have to do a second shift in the home, providing the majority of uncompensated household labor. Naomi Wolf even argues that women are subject to a third shift created by the demands of the patriarchal beauty regime. These extra shifts are forms of expropriation that impose additional burdens on many women. The combination of a standard work schedule along with unpaid extra shifts creates a higher burden of exhaustion. Uh, the tiredness caused by expropriation could help to explain the core feature of CFS, fatigue that lasts for more than six months, as well as why chronic fatigue is more common in, in expropriated groups. If chronic fatigue has another cause, the tiredness caused by expropriation could still make the experience of chronic fatigue more intense or longer lasting. So to summarize the main points of this presentation, I've argued that capitalism and oppression are inextricably linked and oppressed groups are susceptible not only to exploitation, but also to expropriation. Expropriation makes people vulnerable to the hypothesized triggers of CFS and also causes severe and inescapable forms of exhaustion. These political factors help to explain the high rates of CFS in women and certain racialized groups. Since CFS has irreducible political causes, it can't be adequately explained by medical science, um, much less fully eliminated by medical science. The only adequate solution to the adversity experienced by chronically fatigued people is to abolish capitalism, by which I mean racial patriarchal capitalism, which necessarily produces expropriated and exhausted subjects. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Michelle, a really interesting talk, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions. Um, and the first one is from Tatiana von Solodkov, who asks, uh, does the fact that people can recover from chronic fatigue syndrome pose a challenge to its classification as a disability? Um, yeah, it's it's, it's hard for me to answer this, and I was going to say this at the introduction. I just started working on critical disability theory pretty recently in my career because I was initially working on mostly in, in, uh, feminist approaches to responsibility. So I can't exactly say that I can answer these questions with a great deal of authority. Um, <clears throat> but I'm learning a lot from this conference. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, if that would disqualify it, because <clears throat> I don't think that a, I don't think that a disability necessarily has to be permanent. Some disabilities are episodic. Um, there are also there's also the possibility of, for example, being um, yeah. I guess there's the there, you could be born deaf and get a cochlear implant, um, but that doesn't negate the fact that when you you know when you were deaf you had a disability. Um, and I guess even with a cochlear implant, you're deaf, you're born deaf. Um, so I don't think that a disability necessarily has to be lifelong. Um, also, many people just become disabled towards the end of their life. So, you know, for most of their life, they're non-disabled and then they become disabled. So I don't think that a disability has to um, be, be permanent. I think it can be episodic. It can be just at the start of your life, just at the end of your life or in the middle. Um, in, yeah, so I think. Yeah that's something you can kind of extrapolate from other examples of disability. This is interesting, isn't it? Whether there's any received terminology around this, so the distinction between a disease and disability and, and the many different words we have mm -hmm. for, for illness and sickness and the different ways in which they function sociologically. So you, you might phone up your boss and say, I can't come in because I'm ill, but you'd never phone up and say, I can't come in because I'm unhealthy, for example. So, 
you know, the, the, the whole terminology here is, is, is worth investigating. So yeah. we, we have a question from Julie Maybe, um, who says, thanks for a terrific presentation. Do you think that de-industrialization may also increase expropriation? Hmm, another very difficult question. <laughs> I, yeah, it could. Um, Deindustrialization. I didn't think about that part of that aspect of capitalism that much. Um, I guess it depends. We could have some level of deindustrialization due to climate change because climate change could interfere with industrial production if it becomes sufficiently severe. Um, and I, I even now I think it's it's interfering with like agricultural production. Um, and I think that that would actually ex so if you know if that happens due to climate change that could exacerbate expropriation because. Um, expropriation actually on Nancy Fraser's analysis, it tends to occur um, during times of, it, it becomes worse during times of crisis because when expropriation is not generating the surplus value that corporate owners demand, they tend to use expropriation um, <clears throat> to get you know, labor for free or very little money. So I think that if de I guess if, it depends why deindustrialization happens. If it happens due to a crisis like climate change, it would probably exacerbate expropriation. But if it happens voluntarily, um, you know, through some organized political strategy, it could reduce expropriation. So it depends. I would say it depends on the on the circumstances. Okay, thank you so much. So a question from uh, Christine Overall. Uh, Christine asks, uh, well, she begins. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, as I listened. I wondered how chronically fatigued people could be of value to capitalist forces. But then it occurred to me that these mechanisms produce docile, submissive, unrebellious subjects who are unlikely to resist their oppression. Would you agree? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think so. Yeah. So that's, I think that's one factor. I think that disability in, generally, in general is very useful to the capitalist class. And Marta Russell talks about this um, a bit. So she talks about having a permanent, disabled, largely employed class, or cert, like part, you know, a, a surplus population, is beneficial um, to capitalist owners. Um, for one, for one, because it instills fear in workers. So workers are so afraid of becoming disabled and immiserated due to lack of social security that they work harder and they value their labor even more because they could be even worse off because they could belong to, you know, the surplus population comprised predominantly of disabled people. So that's one, um, that's, I think that's one element of it. So, yeah, and um, also having a large uh, population of, having like a stable population of unemployed people reduces inflation. So historically that has been, you know, the aim of um, capitalist and um, the Fed, it's been to, to reduce, um, inflation by maintaining a steady rate of like four to six percent unemployment comprised largely of historically disenfranchised groups so yeah i i um, i think that um having a st stable unemployment is good for capitalism and since people since disabled people tend to be unemployed that is you know part of the system working as intended <laughs> thank you so uh, sarah coppola asks a question i was dreading getting because it contains medical terminology that I only ever read and never say out loud. So I'm going to get this wrong. Uh, but uh, Sarah Coppola asks, are you defining CFS as something separate from myalgic encephalomyelitis or post-viral syndrome, which are medical diagnoses? I don't think that I am, but I know that I know that defining, so <clears throat> I guess they're so like, those are, I think those are typically used interchangeably. So like, if you look at the symptomatic profile, I think it's the same for both. Um, so I would say that for, for my purposes, they're the same. Um, but yes, I, I think that it's very controversial to say that the, like to say that either of those, um, is a disability and not a disease or an illness. But 
the reason that I'm saying that, like I, so I've had chronic fatigue syndrome for a long, long time. Um, and you could potentially have it for the rest of your life um, after the onset of chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, and I see it as a disability like because of the definitions of disability that exist in the literature. So because it has these biopolitical causes <clears throat> um, and because it is something that I think the disability rights movement has a reason to advocate for and because it comes with these challenges and benefits, I think that it fits the definition of a disability. But I know that it's more common to define it as a disease or an illness. I'm, I'm, but I'm contesting that definition. I think that there are good political, many good political reasons to include chronic fatigue syndrome um, under the definition of a disability. And one reason is that often people with chronic fatigue syndrome um, you know, are forced to ask for accommodations or have mobility issues. And so they have the same political interests as many people who have an unambiguous disability. So, you know, they have similar po political um, motivations. Thank you. So now um, we have a question really, I suppose, about medicalization and non-medicalization of disability. So this is from Elena gautier Mamorel, who asks, do you believe that MECFS activism has a place in, in MAD studies, even if the former advocates for more biomedical research as opposed to critiquing systems of medicalization, at least at the moment? So I suppose this is quite a, a good question around the general framework for you, um, because I, is it true that uh, you would be proposing medicalization or biomedical interventions or are you seeing solutions um, in a more social way? Yeah so at the end of my presentation I said that the only solution to chronic fatigue syndrome is political and involves the it involves resistance to patriarchal racial capitalism um, <clears throat> for a variety of reasons. Um, so I think it so I don't really think that medical science can, so, so, okay, so let me just start here. Um, a lot of people are getting post-viral syndrome from COVID-19 now, um, which is very similar to chronic fatigue syndrome. And um, a lot of researchers are saying that um, some people's post-viral syndrome will just resolve into long-term chronic fatigue syndrome. So they will have that for a long time, or if not for life. <clears throat> and, um, I don't really, I don't see how science can prevent chronic fatigue syndrome from, you know, occurring after exposure to a virus. Maybe they could find some, well, <clears throat> yeah. <sighs> yeah, I, might, yeah I, might find I, a miracle steroid or something. That you, yeah. you, could imagine, you could imagine someone right, right. by chance coming up with yeah. just a pill, a pill yeah. that gives you energy back. Right, right. So I guess, yeah, I, I don't think it's very plausible that they're going to find that cure. Um, but I'm not against, I guess I'm not like, I'm not against them finding it. I think for the time being, that's kind of a moot point, because people with chronic fatigue syndrome, um, you know, still need still need political advocacy and accommodations and things like that. So there's still these political issues that are going to occur, as long as science um, doesn't like find a cure for chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, but also, I think that even if um, scientists did find this mir like this miracle cure, um, it wouldn't change the fact that oppressed groups are exhausted. Um, so you know, it's an it's a really substantive question how much that exhaustion from exploitation and expropriation contributes to chronic fatigue syndrome. And um, so you know, that certainly can't be eliminated short of eliminating the, the underlying political causes. Okay, can I pu push this a, a little bit further? I mean, it's a fascinating question about the relation between political structures and chronic fatigue syndrome. Because I think uh, when, when you say that um, you know, political change is needed, I think there are a couple of things, at least, at least two different interpretations of that, and, and maybe they're, they're compatible. So one would be, um, there is a physical syndrome which is caused by a political economic system or at least that system 
high, intensifies it. So if we change the system, then people will undergo physical changes. But another way, which would be much more, much closer to the social model of disability, would be to say that chronic fatigue syndrome is only a problem under capitalism. And that if we had political change, these, these physical characteristics of people would just be difference between energy levels rather than something that was a disability. So I wonder which of those, or maybe somewhere in the middle, uh, would be the position you'd be taking? Yeah, I have to think about that more. So <clears throat> under Marxist analysis, exhaustion, you know, exhaustion is caused by capitalism and it's not a good thing. So <clears throat> I think that yeah, I mean, I guess like chronic fatigue syndrome, <clears throat> the exhaustion inherent. So I, I guess I can't really speak to what ultimately causes, you know, the main symptom of chronic fatigue sy syndrome exhaustion, like how much do how like, and I look at different explanations. So I guess I'm not in a position to arbitrate between all of those explanations. But I think that um, I guess so I, th I think that we definitely, I think that, I guess like looking at chronic fatigue syndrome, it kind of brings to light the fact that capital capitalist labor relations are very exhausting. And I think that certainly contributes to the experience of chronic fatigue syndrome because, you know, it creates this experience of exhaustion. And um, it's with this experience, it's like difficult to enter the workplace because it's not, the workplace is not really designed to be inclusive. It, um, or accessible. Um, so I guess just looking at chronic fatigue, fatigue syndrome, it brings to light this um, more general problem. And I guess that's what I'm just trying try, I guess that's more like what I'm trying to speak to today, because I can't, I can't really speak to the medical analysis. And I, I, the thing is that no one knows really like what what role like if there's a relationship between vi like what the relationship between viral infection and chronic fatigue syndrome is that like as i said medical organizations say that's like a speculative explanation so i can't really speak to that but i think that <clears throat> um exhaustion which is part of chronic fatigue syndrome is something that has underlying political causes that we all have an interest in addressing so I guess like that's the take home. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you so much. So I'm going to take a question from Kathleen Lemon now. So uh, Kathleen asks, it was very interesting to see the figures for CFS to bust the myth that it is particularly a disease of the professional classes. But given that it's a kind of mental and physical burnout, which is not restored by rest, etc., these figures are what you would expect for all the reasons you highlight. But I wonder if you could say more about the way in which work and the imaginary surrounding it are important here. For at least some people who become burnt out in this way, much of the pressure is driven by being given roles with which they identify and believe in and try to fulfill in circumstances where resources are scarce. So the production of subjectivity is crucial here. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I think that is true. Like, um... Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, I'm not sure what to say to that. <laughs> I So I, I don't want to speak, like, I can't speak for everyone with chronic fatigue syndrome, but I feel like, you know, I'm capable of participating in society, but, um, you know, society is not really designed to be accessible. So it, like, creates these barriers. But I think that, like, for, you know, I think that, <clears throat> Generally, you know, people with chronic fatigue syndrome can contribute, but there are these political obstacles. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Fine. So, so let us go back to a question that uh, was rather similar to ones about medicalization diagnosis. So Jan Reinecke uh, says, thank you for your amazing presentation. As a type one diabetic, I'm very interested in how severe stress and exploitation under capitalism can lead to such very severe physiological impacts. In your opinion, is this a domain that the medical sciences should also tackle as part of diagnosis, for example, or should these domains be kept separate? 
Yeah, I definitely, I definitely think that science should address these political issues. Um, and it's, I, it's really not within the realm of science to look at political causes, but <clears throat> yeah, I mean, just like disability is basically like a mismatch between your body and society. And so it's like, so society is basically creating disability. That's Marta Russell's theory that like society is basically um, constructing disability by forcing people out of the, mar out of the, you know, out of the workplace and out of public life. Um, so I think that if like, yeah, I think that science should look at the political factors that contribute to disability. They're really not considering disability as a political construct. Like they're not looking at it from the point of critical disability theory or MAD studies. Um, but I do think that they, it would be in their best interest to incorporate those perspectives. But I, I don't, but I don't, I mean, I, maybe science can't do that. So I, I think, yeah, I, so, you know, I guess that's kind of outside of the remit of science. So I don't know if it can do that, but it would be, you know, it, it would be in, in medical professionals best interest to pay more attention to the environment and to political um, explanations. And there's a huge literature now on the social determinants of health. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, the, the idea of a social gradient in health. But it's interesting that whether or not it's linked up with the disability literature, because it because what it, it's been much more about health and illness, I think, rather than you know, long term disability. So that yeah. Yeah, may, may be a very fruitful area. Yeah. to look because it, in I, some ways you're providing just a much more radical version mm -hmm. of, of things that are already happening in a, in a sort of liberal mainstream discourse but this is pushing it much further yeah actually when i was looking at scientific explanations of chronic of chronic fatigue syndrome i wish that they had to put as potential like so they said viral infection tra um, trauma but I wish they had said expropriation, <laughs> exploitation under capitalism. I would love to have seen that as part of the scientific explanation, actually. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, there is, if you look at Michael Marmot's work, for example, there's a lot of work on, on workplace stress and how it takes year, you know, the, the lower you are in the hierarchy, uh, the more years of life you lose through um, the, the, the way in which the workplace is organized and control over your life and so on. So there, there's quite a bit of work already in that area. So to, I think this is probably a natural, a natural extension. Sorry, I'm take, asking too many questions. I was making too many points myself. We'll go back to the questions. So Mira Helen asks, can we consider CFS as an embodied resistance to capitalism, recognizing that the so-called mind and the body do not always work in what appears to be perfect synchronicity? Interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, that, that I like that idea, actually. Yeah, so it, it, it's an embodied resistance to capitalism. Yeah, I, I should. Yeah, that's a good. I, that's actually a good uh, way of thinking about it. I'm going to I'm going to think about that more. Thank you. I mean, there's so much literature again, isn't there on, on the way you know, the body keeps the score, for example. So right. th this is, a, again, a more radical version of things that are are being said. Um, so here's a, another question. Um, it seems to be crucial for medical practitioners to take CF, CFS serious in early stage after viral infection. So while there is no cure, immediate and adequate physiotherapy, rehabilitation therapy may prevent the condition from being chronic and lifelong, as apparent from studies among youth. And women and racialized and SES people, symptoms of fatigue, headaches, etc., are less likely to be taken seriously and not in the best position to get access to healthcare facilities. Could this be so? I suppose a lack of early diagnosis and treatment for disadvantaged groups is, is that going to be something that contributes to the overall pattern? I think or, I think so. Yeah, certainly um, inequality in healthcare would would um, play a role in like how you how you experience CFS. Um, yeah, I think so. Okay, so I, I've now got the name of the person who asked the question, uh, Anne Rianca uh, Fiuli. Okay, uh, all right. So um, I, th the question I really wanted to ask you um, yeah. was, was about the 
the, I suppose the causal claims. I know I know you're not making at this moment a very clear uh, diagnosis, but but at the end you you do you did say I think that CFS was in, intrinsically linked to expo uh, exploitation and expropriation, and so the analytic philosopher in me coming out saying, well, what is this linkage? Um, you know, obviously it could exist, or it seems that it could exist outside capitalism. So it's not that capitalism is the only cause of exhaustion or chronic fatigue, or would you want to go so far to say it is the only cause, or is, is the claim rather that it, it just makes it more likely or it intensifies it? Yeah. Well, I, I, in my presentation, I was just focusing on how expropriation explains um, differential rates of CFS in dif different groups in our society, like, you know, based on the demographic data. But outside of our society, um, could you have CFS? Yes, because I think oppression also, just like oppression, there's oppression outside of capitalism as well. So you can have, for example, sexual violence outside of capitalism, or you can have easily have like emotional trauma outside of capitalism. And, you know, you could have an exhausting work schedule if you're just oppressed, you know, outside of a capitalist, mm -hmm. like in, in a pre-industrial society, for example. Um, so I think that, yeah, you can have um, CFS, you can have, um, you know, something identical to the experience of chronic fatigue syndrome outside of capitalism. So I don't want to say that it's necessarily a product of capitalism, but I think that capitalism certainly increases the prevalence of CFS and also particularly within these especially oppressed expropriated groups. Okay. And I think you also said to me it, it makes the experience of it perhaps much worse. Um, yeah. Yeah, I get because I was thinking like, I guess CFS is really like the way that we understand it and the symptomatic profile that's been attributed to it. I, I think that is actually an artifact of modern time. So I can't mm. really like exactly take it out of okay. this particular context. But I think you could have something similar, like a very similar, ex like something with similar experiential qualities outside of capitalism where you're reporting sim similar experiences like i'm exhausted and i have some mm. um you know difficulty concentrating headaches yeah. and what have you yeah. but yeah okay. now that i think about it it is it someone like mentioned you know i think someone meant or you mentioned like the body keeps the score that's mm. actually a good way of thinking about it because when i think of things like ptsd you know science is trying to cure ptsd but there are similar issues like you know, do we want to erase that record of, you know, what, um, you know, capitalism or war or what, whatever has done to a person? Like, do we want to erase that record? There are all these political issues about scientific approaches to PTSD. And I, now I'm thinking they're also relevant to chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> so we've got a question from Shelley, Shelley Tremaine. Um, who says, thank you for your informative and instructive presentation, Michelle. Thanks. Given, given the relationship between ra racial capitalism and CFS the, that you recommend, uh, well, we mentioned, uh, do you think that we should think of CFS and people with CFS in Ian Hacking's terms as a transient kind and kind of people respectively? That is, as kinds that can disappear with the abolition of racial capitalism yeah oh yeah that's a good point uh, yeah like i guess i said it can exist outside of capitalism i so i'm i guess let me think i think yeah like could we eliminate it if we eliminate capitalism um i have to think about that more that's a really good question um because maybe we could eliminate the the present under like maybe we could eliminate CFS on the current definition because it's you know that's a socio-political construct but I still I think that I think that some something similar to chronic fatigue syndrome could be brought about by many different forms of oppression you know in the sense of like violence um or um I don't know, it, like maybe exhausting labor outside of a capitalist con, con, context potentially. 
Yeah, that you know, that's an interesting. Okay, I, I'm gonna have to look. I'm gonna have to think about this more because I would be curious to like. I think what I have to do is I have to kind of like look at this more from a historical uh, perspective and look at like how different whether like whether this occurs in different cultures, you know, from like a cross cultural kind of cross historical um, or like ten, you know longitudinal view. So I'm yeah, that's a that's a good proposal, and I'm gonna have to think about that more. I mean I, I can just imagine a fantastic trade book now on the history of tiredness and the uh, and the, the way in which um, well it's, it certainly would link to leisure and it, you know, it, it is said in you know a Marxist historians that before capitalism there were so many holidays in yeah. the year so you know, all the holy days where people took just took days off for festivals so one thing that's happened particularly in North America and particularly in the United States of America is the um, number of paid vacation days shrinking yeah. and shrinking. So, that, so there's room, isn't there, for a cross-cultural yeah. and cross-historical study in the experience of exhaustion. I mean, yeah, I guess on second thought, I th on second thought, I think that chronic fatigue syndrome, the way we understand it, is really linked to capitalism because it real it's really linked. I think it's very linked to certain kinds of adversities that we only have under capitalism, such as like you know not such as not having access to a lot of social institutions, um, and like facing a lot of barriers that arise with capitalism. So. I think that there might be something distinct about about it that does link it to capitalism. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have to think okay. about that more. But that's a that's a good yeah that's a good uh, suggestion. Okay, so this I think is gonna have to be our last question. Okay. It's from um, Ali de Capitani. Do you think there's a connection between CFS capitalism and knowledge acquisition, like how exhaustion may stop people ex experiencing from being informed about current past world affairs? Yeah, I think CFS um, can give you privileged knowledge about um, political oppression, actually, because it, it helps you understand your society better and how, you know, it's built, it, it, how your society is like deeply patriarchal and it makes you kind of question the value of work and um, the um, capital, like the capitalist political system or, you know, just various political issues. So I think that I think that it um, is a source of no of knowledge, similar similar to any kind of oppression. Okay, I mean, so interesting. So that's a link with standpoint theory. It, um, mm. the, the the things that lead to a political disadvantage could lead to a type of epistemic advantage, without mm. necessarily calling it a, a privilege. Okay, so well, thank you. So much, Michelle. Really fascinating presentation. Very lively, interesting discussion. And um, we're delighted yeah. that you were able to join us. So um, we'll bring this first session to a close now. Uh, we'll be back for the second session at um, five minutes past the hour. Uh, just for the people who uh, in the panel and the participants to inform you all, the cameras and sound will stay on in the break, but we're in sort of informal session here for 10 minutes talking about technical issues and so on uh, until we start on the next session. So Michelle, thank you so much. And let me give you thank a you. round of applause on behalf of everyone else. You can probably only see me applauding, but uh, there's a lot of appreciation in the chat. Thank you. you. Thanks for those but, challenging and thought provoking questions. As <laughs> I said, I, de I definitely have to think about this more because I'm new to this discipline. But yeah, thank you, everyone. Okay. okay. Thanks so much.